Hey there, it is Irene Lyon. Welcome to this video, to this YouTube channel, and to this world of healing trauma, nervous system health, and all things neuroplasticity. Today I want to talk about a question I'm getting a lot more these days, and that is, how do I find a somatic practitioner? And I might add a word to that. How do you find a good somatic practitioner? Now, before I get into the main things to look for and maybe ask potential practitioners, there is a macro topic here that I want to cover first, and that is there is no official professional designation for somatic practitioner. Practitioner, If I compare it to, say, medicine as one of the more easier examples to give you a comparison, with medicine, you are a doctor. You go through your four years of training. Usually it's more than that. You have to do pre-med, you do med, you might do a specialty, you have to do your internship exams, all of it. It's an intensive process and that graduates you as a medical doctor. All countries in the world have a version of that that clearly are going to be a little bit different, but the, the bases, the foundations, the main pieces, the textbooks are roughly all the same. With the field that I am in, healing and helping people at the nervous system level, working with trauma at the somatic body level, the neurophysiological level, this is a fairly new art and science. It's actually called the new traumatology. This is the work that Peter Levine um, is into. That's someone I have studied with, that is somatic, somatic experiencing. Kathy Kane, another colleague of mine, somatic practice, if we think of Books like When the Body Says No, The Body Keeps the Score by Gabor Mate and Bessel van der Kolk, respectively, Robert Scare, um, The Body Bears the Burden and, and Trauma Spectrum. These are books that are sort of the seminal pieces of writing that have really looked at this new traumatology and the importance of not just working with the cognition when it comes to helping someone heal from traumatic experiences and PTSD and chronic illnesses that are there as a result of untreated early trauma, these folks have paved the way for this new sort of traumatology. And so there isn't a psych, you know, if you think about a psychologist or a counselor, they go to a counseling school, they'll go to university to become a psychologist. The work that we are doing is so new that a practitioner, myself included, we have to start studying and then follow our gut, follow, follow our impulse, and find the next thing to study and the next thing to study, working with the pioneers at this point, many of which who are still alive, which is really cool. So there's no actual designation. So that's the first thing to understand. It doesn't mean that this work is not powerful and potent, but what it does mean is you have to be way more cautious and way more, um, you just have to be more cautious and treat it like an interview process. So these are the main things. There's about five of them that I'm going to outline. The first is credentials. Now I will be a hundred percent honest here as someone who has worked her butt off to get the credentials I have starting in 1993, which is more than 20 years ago. Um, I believe in credentials. And I think when we're dealing with matters literally of the heart and the gut and the brain and them being unwell and us helping people recover from various troubles and adversities and injuries and shock traumas, we need to ensure that we're working with someone who knows what they're doing and who has had some level of training. Now, my training is vast. I won't go through all the pieces. You can go to my website to see all of those. I will link that below. But the main professional trainings, the trainings that I've done that certify me in a sense to work at this nervous system level, there are three of them. One is called the Feldenkrais Method. One is somatic experiencing, and the other is the work of Kathy Kane, somatic practice. So when I'm working with someone, whether it's one-on-one -on -one, in group or on my online in my online courses where I'm teaching folks how to ed educate themselves and then heal themselves, I'm mixing in all of those methods into one kind of soup, one skill set. And so the student takes that on and gets all these different methods and modalities from 
obviously the mentors that I have worked with. I also have a background in health science, exercise science, and bio biomedical science. So when it comes to credentials, someone doesn't have to have all that I have, but I will admit when working at this trauma level, this new traumatology level, usually one certification isn't enough. Maybe I'm being a little daring by saying that, but if someone has only done a somatic experiencing training and they don't have some other training in another field of study or they haven't continued to refine their studies in somatic ex somatic experiencing whether that's working with another mentor like kathy kane um, we have other mentors in our field one and other one is larry heller um, there are so many other mentors that continue to teach those who have studied SCE, sort of the next steps. So credentials are important. And the other thing about credentials is if someone doesn't have any credentials on their website, chances are they don't have them. Now, there might be some exceptions here where someone chooses not to put their certifications and credentials on a website. Personally, that would be weird to me because we earn those credentials. We do a lot of work to get them. And we want to show those off in a sense to show we've done the work, we're qualified, we can help you. So if say you come across someone that you want to work with and you like, and I'll get to that in a moment, and they don't, you don't see credentials, ask, just ask. Maybe their scope of practice is such that they can't work with the deeper traumas, but maybe they'd be a great health coach who is trauma informed. Trauma informed is very different than trauma trained. And we have to understand that they're two different beasts. That's for another video. So first of all, credentials, 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 make sure they have some form of credentials and ask, do not be afraid to ask just because we're at that time right now in our universe, in our world, where we don't have that one professional designation similar to medical school. One day, hopefully we will, but we're not there yet. The second thing you want to ask a potential somatic practitioner or however they may call themselves is these, these few words, can you help me? Can you help me? Can you help me? And that might seem kind of redundant because well, they are someone who is working at this level, they do this for a living, why wouldn't they be able to help me? Why wouldn't they, you know, that should be a given. But here's what's interesting is that this is another line of, let's say, defense for you, the potential customer or client to test them and say, do you think you can help me? I've just given you my history. Maybe you have a history that's quite complex. Maybe the individual is new in their, in their practice and they are very good and they're very keen, but maybe they're just not the right one for you, right? It all depends on the comfort level of the practitioner being able to say, yes, I can help you. And here's how I'll get into that in a second. And so how you listen, if you're talking to them on the phone, how you feel their words through email, however it is that you might communicate with this potential practitioner from the beginning, ask those questions or that question, can you help me and see what they say. And there's nothing wrong with asking a few more questions after that, if they have a little stumble, because perhaps they've never been asked that before, you can always point them back to this video. And if they are in any ways threatened by this advice I am giving you now, then you probably know that they are not the right person to work with. So first of all, credentials. Second, can they help you? Third is this, can they show you a treatment plan? Now, treatment is a funny word because that's for medical term for medicine and such, but a treatment plan is essentially how do they think that they're going to work with you based on what you've said, based on your history, the other things you've worked with. It doesn't have to be exact, but it's something like this. Well, considering you have had a history of early trauma and you've also had this car accident and you're having these troubles with your vision and whatever, um, I would like to do X, Y, Z, A, B, C, or I would like to do this first, or let's see what happens if we have one session and just see what occurs with your system. Because this is not an exact science, 
Well, actually not much is, is it? Is there, right? Even in medicine, there are, are things that can go sideways and complications and paths need to be changed and treatment plans need to be changed. But that's a part of this as well, is that can the person confidently say, yeah, this is where I would start, but can they also have the confidence to say, and it's possible that once we start working together and I get to know your system a little better and we become a little more you know, in good rapport and your system settles, things might speed up and we can go to this sooner. Or maybe we might find that your system needs to be way slower and more titrated. And maybe our sessions aren't an hour long, they're 30 minutes long. Many of my colleagues in the somatic experiencing and somatic practice fields are finding that their sessions are getting shorter because when we have had a history of adversity and early trauma that is not treated, the system can only handle so much. And this is this concept that Peter Levine has coined for the new traumatology, which is titration. Titration, 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 which basically means we want to do little drops of work at a time so that we don't over flood the system, overload it, and then it puts it into more shock, more survival stress, and more kind of freeze and shutdown and resistance. We want to introduce new things slowly so that the system can soak it up, integrate it, settle, and then find a new baseline. So again, treatment plan is important, but also asking this person, how do you know, or how do you plan this as we move forward? Do we shift? Do we slow down? Do we speed up? The other thing that goes with treatment plan on an aside, there used to be a point in my career where I wanted to have a client sort of commit to six, six months or 12 months or a certain amount of sessions. And I think that's okay, but there's another element to this story around safety. So if there is a history of a lot of unsafety in a person's system, it will feel uncomfortable often for them, maybe you the client, to lock in, say, 50 sessions or 12 sessions or hand over a big chunk of money for an entire year of sessions. And here's the thing, we, we don't know, the practitioner won't know how things turn out until you start to do the work. If someone can say to you, oh, without a doubt, in a year, we're gonna get to here, 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 and you're just gonna be 100% better, don't go to that person because that kind of claim cannot be made. We do not know what is gonna happen. We do not know how quickly, how slow, how um, titrated a person's process through healing at this deep nervous, nervous system level must be, and we have to respect that. So if someone says, I only work with people in this way, question that, maybe they will make an exception. And if they say, nope, you have to do this, you gotta lock in, then for me at least, that would be my sign to walk away and find someone else. And then the next thing that I think is super important, and this was something that Peter Levine actually tipped off a few of us in a masterclass long ago, and that is as the, as the client, I should say, I would be the practitioner, but as the client, do you like the practitioner? So when you meet them, whether it's over phone or Skype or in person, is there a sense of, this person's kind of cool, I like them. They, they feel good to me. They are someone that I would want to hang out with. And I, I don't, mean that, don't mean that in a sense that you should be hanging out with them outside of the therapeutic relationship because that's not what we're supposed to do. But do you feel at ease? With them or a little more at ease than normal. This is very different than do you feel safe with the person? Now let me explain that a little bit. I say that specifically because if there is a history of early traumatic stress, adversity in someone's life, it's very possible that even when they are 50 years old, no one in the world feels safe. That's why they're there. That's why you might be seeking out a somatic practitioner is you know that at the cellular level, you are not safe in your skin and you wanna change that, you wanna heal that and it can be healed and changed. So know that a practitioner may not feel safe, quote unquote, but you may have a sense of, I like this person. Yep, not 100% safe, because that's how I know my system is and we're gonna work on that, but I like this person, they're cool, I wanna hang out with them a few times a month to work with them, just like that. So as simple as that is, 
And that might seem very different than my first few points around credentials and treatment plans and can they help you. At the end of the day, you are the person who will be paying your hard-earned money to someone to help you. So not only should they have confidence that they can help you, you, the person, need to like them enough to know I can hang out with this person. The next thing that is more of an aside to this, um, but falls into all of these in a way, is know that you don't have to continue with someone. So if something happens where, and I don't mean the moment they have you feel an uncomfortable sensation, that's your cue to leave and not work with them again, because trust me, and I've said this in many of my other videos, we will feel uncomfortable sensations. We will feel activation. We might feel a bit more shut down. That's part of this somatic process, this new traumatology. So you're going to have to stick with someone through uncomfortable things, through discomfort. That's part of the process. They need to push you a little bit to feel things and in, a, of course, a safe way where you have consented to that and that is your agreement and contract. But if there's just after a bit of time, you just are like, there's something about this. It's just not working for me. And you have to know what that is. It's always okay to say, you know what? Thank you. But I think I'm going to discontinue my work with you. Thank you. And bye bye. And that is one way to work with boundaries. It is one way to ensure that you are staying in integrity with how you feel and how this person is in relationship to you. As I said, there will be moments where we might not like the somatic practitioner. I've had my clients in the past say, I really don't like you right now, but it's not because they don't like me. They are having discomfort in what they are now noticing and, sense, and sensing because of the work we're doing together. And that's just part of the process. So to recap, credentials, number one, can they help you, number two, can they give you a treatment plan? Number three. And then number four, do you like them? And then sort of the side, these side pieces, which might be, or I shouldn't say might be, you knowing that if you want to stop, you have permission to do that. And that falls into that piece around not binding in for long contracts where you're linked with them for a year because you've paid them a certain amount of money that sets up a weird dynamic and then maybe one final thing i will say is get educated so whether it's through watching my videos doing one of my programs the more you understand about your physiology and how you tick on the inside and have homework to do when you're not in private session with someone the better in a sense and more efficient that one-on-one -on -one work is what I've seen with my colleagues who have worked with my students who've gone through the online learning that I offer is those individuals, those students, those clients that they work with, they work with them a little more efficiently. It's a little easier to work with them because they understand the theory. They understand how to track their sensation. They know how to orient to the environment. They know that they're going to maybe sense uncomfortable qualities within their physiology. So when we, as the client prepare to do one-on-one -on -one work, the work becomes more efficient, more effective. I will admit you might save some money because you're not having to sit there with your practitioner while they teach you the underpinnings of how nervous system physiology works and also how to do self sort of care practices at home. That's what I do these days is teach people how to do that so that they can do more effective and efficient one-on-one -on -one work. All right, that was a lot all to say. This is how you find a good somatic practitioner. I hope you take some of these pieces into consideration when you look for someone. Thank you so much for being here and we will see you next time.